Okay, so hello and welcome back to everybody who's joining us for, for these sessions from this morning to now. Um, it's been a wonderful morning. We've had a session this morning with the WHO's Dr. Raman Validuan looking at COVID-19 and the impact of COVID global vector control, the impact to global vector control strategies. We've moved from there to surveillance in terms of uh, vector-borne disease surveillance, linking that to vector control policies. Very very interestingly, in the last session, um, we had uh, Dr. Ayman Ahmed from Sudan, uh, from the, one of the National Centers of Disease Control in, in, in Sudan, the National Academy of Sciences, with a seminal paper looking at a new threat in the African region of a, uh, a, a new kind of threat from a, a, a not kind of standard mosquito, kind of the, the Gambi or the Aedes aegypti, Anopheles defensi. Um, and kind of the lessons of vector control. Within that presentation, there's a key point made that it really, this particular species has adapted to, yes, Defensi has adapted to urban settings. So really highlighting, as the other presenters had done as well, the kind of importance of involving the, and, and uh, assessing the built environment and its kind of impact um, uh, to, to vector control per se. We're delighted to have uh, this session, in, we've put it in two halves because some of the speakers have to leave and we're delighted to kind of um, cover the fact that a few, you know, just very recently, a few days ago, there's a memorandum of understanding signed between the United Nations Habitat, UN Habitat and the WHO looking to kind of bring together the built environment um, and public health uh, in terms of closer sectorial collaboration, we hear of this whole need for multi-sectorial uh, you know, kind of uh, enhancement, enhanced collaboration. Well, it's actually happening with that memorandum of um, understanding. And I do wonder, and I do hope that the built environment, the approach to built environment becomes the touchstone uh, for further multi-sector collaboration uh, within vector control and the strategies that come out of that. I think that's enough from me because we're kind of uh, short for time. So I'd like to give a real, I'll introduce all the, the panelists as we go along, but for the first session, first half of this session, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Natalie Laurie Robel from the Department of Public Health, Environmental and Social Determinants of Health at the World Health Organization. And also Dr. Graham Alabaster, from the Urban Basic Services Branch at UN Habitat, and they can have a joint presentation looking um, at, at this particular area. So I think that's enough from me, um, and I'm going to pass over the floor to you guys. Thank you very much, and a good afternoon to everybody, or good morning, depending, or good evening, depending of where colleagues are connected from. Thank you for having us here. Um, well, maybe just to start, we have chosen the title Accelerating Action on Urban Health, Renewed Collaboration Between WHO and New Inhabited. And must, maybe I can start by saying that the title is not completely true because collaboration has actually been ongoing for many years, has never been stopped, uh, and we have been always closely working together as the two organizations, one leading uh, the response to health needs and the other looking specifically on urban development. But this memorandum of understanding is a very important piece to really frame uh, our uh, joint work around accelerating really the impact that urban development has on health. And therefore, we felt that the time was actually appropriate right, to put this collaboration uh, again in a, in a consolidated memorandum of understanding. So um, on here you see, this is really fresh. Uh, this happened actually two to three weeks ago, I say 8th of October. Graham, please correct me if I'm wrong. And, and we really were very happy to see actually leadership from both organizations strongly supporting this work, strongly supporting the technical efforts that were made respectively. And, and um, so we had the signature moment uh, a couple of, of weeks ago. Now, maybe just to start, uh, I think uh, I would like to highlight some of the needs uh, that actually led to having this renewed memorandum of understanding. Um, and in particular, I would say the express needs by member states uh, of having urban health issues being raised as a 
public health priority, um, with the specific objective to focus on health and health equity and quality of life uh, in the broader sense. So the elevation of urban issues is something that has been recognized by member states and has been, you know, expressed in different fora. Um, and therefore, the memorandum of understanding really respects and responds to the core. Now, secondly, I think one of the key needs that uh, we are aiming to address with this memorandum is the evidence generation need for sustaining action. And here I think the important point would be to stress the fact on social and environmental determinants of health in urban settings. Certainly when we look at uh, urban health, uh, we need to look this from an environmental, but also at the same time from a social determinants of health perspective, particularly if we want to make sure that we take uh, a health equity uh, approach to it. So the whole memorandum of understanding has been really being framed uh, and, and, and maybe just to give you um, an institutional update from WHO's perspective, there has been a renewed commitment on urban health by creating a key actually function to coordinate WHO's uh, urban health work across the WHO headquarters, but also the region, which is actually located within the social determinants of health department. So just to give you an idea of how institutionally also this piece of work is going to be framed. Thirdly, um, there's a clear understanding that capacity building and empowerment of local governments, communities, but also professional networks and the urban poor uh, is actually required and needed in order to actually empower all these actors to really modify the determinants of health. Uh, and this has been, you know, translated and you will see it later on in the concrete actions. Uh, fourth point is also the um, uh, renewed understanding that there is a need for a strong advocacy for intersectoral policies, but also multi-sectoral activities for health and development. And in, in this context, also the need to really be focusing some of the key activities and priorities to the most vulnerable population groups in urban settings. So certainly urban poor, slum dwellers, homeless people, migrants, refugees, displaced persons need to be put at the forefront of our activities. And while this has been always the case in the past in the activities, this memorandum of understanding really wants to highlight the need of working and identifying the most vulnerable and to find actually ad the adequate um, interventions to address uh, the needs. And finally, to put it in the context also of the current COVID pandemic, but also beyond, there was a clear recognition that joint work needs to be actually taking into consideration the emergency preparedness and response aspect to foodborne, to climate change and urban crisis, but certainly also including anthropogenic, zoonotic and naturally occurring emergencies. So the whole notion of emergency preparedness and response has been really recognized as one of the fundamental entry points to this renewed collaboration. Graham, over to you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, so as you can see, this is a sort of rather overarching MOU, bringing together lots of already existing work. But the main, of course, driver from this comes from the mandates of both the organisations. Um, on the one hand, WHO's programme of work, um, and on our, from our side, the, the new urban agenda. Now, the new urban agenda, as many of you know, was agreed in Quito back in 2016. And in early versions of the draft of the new urban agenda, health was missing. Um, and so our relationship really uh, between the two organizations started then because there was a need to ensure that health was properly reflected in the new mandate for urban. And I mean, I think the important thing about uh, the new urban agenda, and this is uh, really a very important issue, that many of the urban areas where we're seeking to make a difference have yet to be built. Because though we can influence the environment uh, of, uh, of course, existing urban settings, there's a huge need to look at the design of new urban settings. And I mean, these can be new from greenfield sites, or they can be the rapidly urbanizing small towns and villages uh, in many places around the world. This is typical of the form of urbanization that's going ahead in Africa. So it's not just about existing space, it's also about future space. And of course, there are other mandates uh, as well, which are equally important, the uh, international health regulations of WHO and also the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. 
because we know the world is changing and urbanization uh, and it's, it is impacted upon hugely by natural disasters and conflict. And uh, many of the displaced people that we see uh, are, are, of course, uh, moving into urban centers to, uh, to uh, you know, to make a living or to find security and safety. So we've got this huge, aside from the natural urbanization, we've got also the induced urbanization from these other factors. So it's incredibly important. Um, one of the important uh, aims and priorities for this agreement, of course, is to harmonize approaches. And one of the most important areas uh, is, of course, on the area of urban data, because many of the marginalized communities are not recognized in many urban centers throughout the world because the, the tools that are used to measure the data at the local level um, are not uh, good enough to pick up these intra-urban differences. So, for example, if you look at the overall statistics for a big city, it won't show you that the poor in that city uh, are much more compromised and much more vulnerable. And of course, the, the data problem is also very important because without this good data, you can't make um, good decisions at the local level. And I mean, you know, if we're looking at the control of disease, we're looking at the control of vector-borne disease, for example. If you understand and have disaggregated data about where the most vulnerable populations are, you can use your resources more effectively. The fourth area, of course, is to understand uh, much more the research and innovation into urban health, and most importantly, to understand uh, risk. We, in the process still of a, of a global pandemic, and we need to make sure that in the future we have some resilience put in place uh, at the urban level to understand these risks. And as I said before, there are many factors that influence these risks, including, of course, the socioeconomic situation of residents in urban areas, but also the other factors that are impact on them. One other important aspect of this um, agreement is uh, it's not just a linkage between the two headquarters. The headquarters of, uh, of, of WHO is, of course, in Geneva. For Habitat, we're based in, uh, in Nairobi. But the idea is that this um, MOU provides, if you like, a matrix agreement between the two organizations, linking the centers of research expertise within the headquarters, but also the operational activities, because both organizations have a responsibility for so-called normative work, the setting of guidelines and standards, but also work on the operational aspects of, uh, of interventions. So I'll hand over to uh, Natalie for the next slide. Thank you very much, Graham. So uh, with this next slide, we would like just to briefly present you the specific technical themes that are covered uh, by the Memorandum of Understanding. And certainly, uh, I will just be very brief also in view of time. But you can see on this slide that actually this Memorandum of Understanding is covering a, actually a quite large range of, um, of topics, starting from urban and territorial planning and health, uh, but also uh, looking at non-communicable diseases and injury prevention in urban settings, uh, urban environment and health and basic services, but then also specifically in building on what Graham just highlighted, uh, the ongoing joint work on emergency preparedness and response in urban settings, uh, with a very specific focus on risk management that has and really uses uh, an inclusive approach of all hazards, uh, including COVID-19, but also other uh, communicable diseases and outbreaks and, and climate change impacts. And then urban health migration, environmental management of vector-borne diseases, which is certainly at the core of the discussions today, safe, healthy housing, and then safer and healthier diets in cities. Now, obviously, these themes are not exclusive, um, as uh, there are other ongoing collaborations, but I would say that these ones were those that have been identified as priority areas. And certainly, as we go, uh, additional uh, joint pieces of work will be added uh, to, you know, um, uh, the next work plans for the years to come. 
Uh, one important uh, issue that I would like to highlight here before Graham is going to be speaking a little bit more in detail about the work which is going to be planned on environmental management of vector-borne diseases, is that actually all these areas are really conceived to be interlinked. So, for example, when we look at safe and healthy housing, uh, Many of you may know that in 2018, we have launched the WHO Housing and Health Guidelines, which were actually the first WHO normative guidelines focusing one specific sector. Uh, and UN Habitat has been closely collaborating with WHO on that. The reason is that when looking at housing and health, we certainly want to see how the work on the implementation of the guidelines is going to be serving the work on environmental management of vector-borne diseases. So we have been closely working with our colleagues across the house to be looking at some of the evidence on effective built environment housing interventions that are actually to be promoted for vector control. We're working closely with providing joint information material, policy briefs, and therefore all these different areas um, really conceived to be not focused and shaped uh, in a silos, but to be shaped actually in a way that they can complement each other. Obviously, urban and territorial planning is key for uh, supporting the work on environmental management of vector-borne diseases. So with this, this memorandum of understanding, although it highlights these specific technical entry points, it's really been, you know, developed and we hope that in the implementation, it will help us uh, to, to develop a comprehensive framing, a framework on urban health that will be encompassing all those different uh, pieces of the work. But maybe now uh, over to Graham again for uh, some more information on the environmental management of vector-borne diseases. Over to you. Thanks, Natalie. Well, um, you know, this is a clear example of something that uh, hasn't just started uh, in our relationship with WHO. But if we go back to the 1990s where, where um, a joint panel of experts was established between WHO, UNEP, Habitat and FAO to look at the environmental management of vector-borne disease. There was lots of amazing research done, uh, including some on the urbanization of disease vectors. Um, and this really uh, started to sort of, uh, was the first uh, example, as I say, back in the 90s, where we started looking much more closely at environmental management of vector control and systematizing that. There's a range of publications that were produced <laughs> They're all on paper, none of them are probably available electronically. But this was uh, the beginning of a lot of this joint work together. Um, of course, you and Habitat uh, and WHO also work together very closely on the Roll Black Malaria Initiative. Uh, and that's been ongoing for the past several years uh, and has been reviewed and updated uh, to meet uh, changes and in increasing demands. But perhaps um, one of the most exciting things is the, the developments on multi-sexual approaches in urban settings. Because of course, uh, in, in, in many situations, very good tools uh, um, have been developed, uh, you know, for rural settings and non-urban settings, and includes capacity development and advocacy, uh, and, and, you know, such things as integrated vector management. But of course, they weren't always applicable in urban settings. So there now needs to be really an update of many of this uh, historical uh, information um, and to bring it, uh, uh, if you like, bring it up to date so that it can cope with uh, urban settings. And we must remember that uh, urban uh, is, a, is a very uh, loose term because it can go from anything from a small village, which many people would still class as just rural, up to, of course, the megacities and anything in between. So understanding how Many of these existing tools uh, were, were, that were developed, principally focusing on rural settings, how they can be applied across the urban, uh, rural to urban continuum uh, is, is very important. And that will be the basis of a lot of our work. Um, of course, much of this work uh, is related to providing technical assistance and, and knowledge exchange. And uh, a lot of the work that um, you know, Habitat does in the field in planning and working in urban space in housing and in planning uh, cities and urban areas, much of this good uh, technical advice is, of course, um, put to uh, put to good use. Um, you've heard, I think, already this morning it was alluded to by the initial uh, speaker about the urbanisation of malaria. And uh, as we speak, there's a there's a there's a large group 
uh, ongoing are looking at the response to urban area. And um, I, together with uh, Professor Alex Ezra at Drexel University, uh, are, are chairing the group within that that's looking at urban governance and how, when you start to apply the, the, some of the approaches of managing malaria in an urban setting, because of the more complex governance arrangements, we need to uh, look and understand what the uh, what the impediments are. And uh, of course, it's also very interesting because, of course, we're reading, of course, about the opportunities with malaria vaccine. But it's very important to understand that we need, of course, both. We can't just rely on this in the future. We have to also rely on some of the basic public health uh, intervention measures to manage uh, diseases like malaria and others like dengue effectively. Um, one, of course, the, the, the Rollback Malaria Multi-Sector Group, which I, I, I co-chair, uh, there's been some very good examples of how we've managed to work with many actors uh, outside of the, the classic health sector, with the private sector and other such actors, to get them to understand uh, their, the contribution they can make to the management of vector-borne disease. So there's a lot of work ongoing uh, in that RBM group, along with others around the world. Perhaps one of the most uh, exciting recent initiatives which we're developing uh, is uh, so-called a, a new partnership uh, uh, called Healthy Cities, Healthy People. And this is specifically aimed at both vector-borne and neglected tropical diseases. And the idea behind this uh, initiative is to use the power of local authorities and in particular mayors to uh, empower them to improve uh, the application and the management of uh, the vector-borne and uh, neglected tropical diseases. Why is it so important to focus on mayors? Because mayors and city leaders have this unique role in that they're responsible for implementing national, uh, national action plans, national ministries of health engaged in, in vector-borne disease management. So they need to reach up uh, to national governments and work with them, but then also they're in the best position to mobilize uh, actively the communities that are responsible for. Community is also a very diverse term and it's only city leaders who really understand how to untap the opportunity. So this initiative is about empowering mayors to work both uh, vertically, if you like, with national government ministries, not just Ministry of Health, but other line ministries, and also the various elements of community. So um, really this idea of, of sharing good experiences across cities, uh, and understanding how different interventions work for urban health is critical. And we hope that this is one of the uh, things that we can bring to, uh, to this initiative, uh, sharing between regions. Quite often you find because of the way things are set up, the way financing is siloed, the way people tend to work in regions, there's very little opportunity to share these ideas uh, across regions. So we hope very much that we can do that. So I will um, stop there. And of course, if any of you need any more details, we can uh, we can uh, we can share those with you. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much, and not much to add. Uh, just to thank you for for um, for being here and, and listening to us, and certainly just to reinforce that all this work. Um, needs to rely on close collaboration with a large number of partners uh, that are in the room and beyond. And maybe just to finish with one sentence, the building of what Graham was saying about the role of mayors, is that actually from a health perspective, the true uh, health ministers are actually uh, mayors because they are the ones that very often uh, need to implement the policies that really need to make sure that the populations are, you know, healthy and safe. So. Uh, with this, thank you very much for your attention and, and, and back to all of you. And I'm going to stop sharing uh, my presentation. Thank you very, very much to Natalie and to Graham. I think that's an absolute seminal moment in terms of this memorandum of understanding. And we're all very excited, delighted you could make this meeting today. And just to set the kind of scene, um, many, many opportunities um, have become apparent from that presentation, the joint presentation there, um, you know, we're talking about concrete participation of local partners, we're talking about communities, mun municipalities, you're mentioning the, the mayors, I think it's absolutely fantastic and really this is what we need uh, and I just wonder how Vector Control is going to engage with you on that and I suppose on that basis, if any, I wanted to ask this because I do know, I know you have to go to another meeting and that's why you split this in time, I'm very aware of that. Um, 
if they, anybody wants to get in touch with you, you put your, you're okay with that in terms of direct contact by your email that, that you put up? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's very, very kind of you. And we know you're very, very busy. So thank you very, very much. I think a round of applause uh, for you. We're being joined from uh, right across the world actually today um, in terms of Mexico. We've got uh, Dr. Well, Daniel Velaquez from uh, Mexico. We've got medical entomologist from the MCDI in Equatorial Guinea, Dr. Dennis Masui. Uh, Dr. Rosibel Drury is actually one of the, the uh, heads of the, of the dengue effort at the uh, company Merck Sharp Dome, MSD. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Alhaji Amadou Niang. Um, who's joining us, uh, entomologist from Sheikh Anta Diop University of Dakar in Senegal. Uh, from Senegal, we go to Uganda via the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Catherine Snyman, a varied audience. And um, as you've all heard, uh, you can contact directly uh, into this uh, thing. I'm sure as we move forward, we'll be watching this very very closely and seeing how that develops i think i'm going to let you go because i can see that you have to go so thank you and just feel free to just to you, you can just leave the room and it's fine we'll, we'll just stay here all right thank you thank you very you much, very much. Okay. thank you thank you very much everyone a lot. Have a rest of a good day thank you and thanks a lot bye-bye Bye. um and so as um, obviously they've left we are now moving to the second half of this particular session we've heard how important uh, uh, the, this entire built environment approach is um, very much becoming the kind of potential to become a touchstone for kind of um, positive uh, kind of how to put this uh, better vector control, better disease prevention and control. Um, and I think that's really been set out there, especially the social determinants uh, aspect of it by Natalie and Graham. So that's fantastic. That brings me on to the rest of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the session. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Dr. Fiona Shenton from the uh, Bova Network uh, and, and Dome University, um, who's going to be looking at vector-borne diseases in towns and cities, and also by Professor Olaf Horstuk, um, who's an independent consultant now. But for those of you in there, he was from the TDIWHO and the University of Heidelberg, now in the, in the, and as an independent consultant, looking at the role of urbanization, the spread of aging mosquitoes and the diseases that they uh, transmit. So I think a round of applause for, for, for both of the, the panelists. And uh, I think I'll hand the floor over to you, Dr. Shenton, to Fiona, if that's okay. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, of course, uh, what we've just heard from Natalie and Graham is music to our ears. And um, essentially, this is about pandemic preparedness. Despite sometimes the impression that may be given in the media, uh, this COVID-19 um, pandemic is by no means unprecedented. Um, most of you here are probably familiar with the Spanish flu, which caused the deaths of between 17, maybe more than 50 million people, um, which far outstripped the numbers of young men killed in combat during World War I. And uh, new and emerging infections are occurring at a faster rate than ever, as you can see from the list here. And I'll um, draw your attention to these three, Zika, dengue virus and yellow fever, which of course all arbor viruses transmitted by the urban mosquito Aedes aegypti and um, uh, more on dengue later from Olaf. Um, so the rise in the global burden of arboviral diseases is exemplified by this map here, which shows the increase in dengue risk at risk um, across the world. And uh, you can clearly see the, um, the threat in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and the Far East. So global cases of, of dengue have increased eightfold since 2000. And um, in 2019, they were already at 4.2 million. There's almost certainly under-reporting of cases. Zika has spread to 62 countries since 2015, and 
in 2016, a yellow fever outbreak in Angola, which spread to the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. Uh, there were over 4,000 cases and 388 deaths. Chikungunya first described in 1952 is now in 60 countries, and we don't know what might be next. And this is about moving house. The, um, the urban mosquito Aedes aegypti, which transmits these arbor viruses, um, the ancestral form laid its eggs in trees and holes in Africa and fed on forest animals. But it now thrives in plastic containers, plant pots, gutters, tires and water storage containers. So it, it's an invasive species. In short, it should not be here, but we provided a perfect environment for it. And as Graham pointed out just now, um, the, the, the rise in, um, the, uh, in the population on the planet and in urban areas, we have 7.4 billion now, it predicted to rise to 9.7 billion in 2050. Today, more, already more than half of us are city dwellers, but that's predicted to rise to 66% of people living in cities by 2050. And the effect of rapid urbanization is high population densities, poor housing, lack of clean water, sanitation and refuse collection, environmental deterioration. And we've created this new habitat, the urban environment. This map uh, shows the global distribution of the mosquito Aedes aegypti in 2015 and uh, in the dark grey shaded areas across the globe and superimposed with the red dots are cities where there are more than a million inhabitants and again you can see the overlap here and uh, the key point made earlier is that 60 percent of urban areas that will exist in 2050 have not yet been built so this is a, a window of opportunity to think strategically and plan ahead for a better infrastructure. So the WHO's Global Vector Control Response, which is 2017-2030, is a response. It, it is the strategy for how to reduce the burden and threat of vector-borne diseases. And it relies on these, uh, it relies on four action pillars. Uh, to strengthen inter and intra-sectoral action and collaboration, to engage and mobilize communities, to enhance vector surveillance and monitoring and the evaluation of interventions, and then the scale up and integration of new tools and approaches. But you can see on the right of my slide these very important enabling factors. If if the if these strategies um, are to lead to um, locally adapted and sustainable vector control. It's important that we have uh, good country leadership, advocacy, resource mobilization and partner coordination, regulatory policy and normative support. We published last year our recommendations uh, for, for, for things that we can do now to protect ourselves from mosquitoes. And we use the deliver mnemonic um, to illustrate this. So D for doors, which um, should be close fitting, uh, self, self closing and screened. E for eaves, so blocking and um, or screening eaves to prevent mosquito entry by that route. Lifting houses above the ground where possible, because that has been shown to reduce mosquito entry. Uh, insect, insecticide treated bed nets, we're all very well aware of. Good ventilation is essential, keeping the temperatures down and also for reducing the levels of expired uh, carbon dioxide by occupants of houses, um, carbon dioxide being an important mosquito attractant. E for the environment, um, good environmental management to keep houses and the surroundings clear of anything where water can pool and collect and provide breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And similarly, roofs should be um, pitched roofs to, so that water can drain easily off them. 
And it is completely essential nowadays that we go green. Uh, and our recommendations should lead to less reliance on insecticides, cooler, better ventilated homes, waste reduction and good environmental management. In short, what's not to like. Um, sustainability has to um, underpin all our interventions nowadays. Uh, we can see how um, of the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 11 is um, directly relevant to our talk today, making cities inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. But if we're to achieve effective um, control of vector-borne diseases, um, these other goals have to come into play. So I would say that arguably one of the most important is the last of the, uh, the SDGs, Goal 17, which is the partnership for the goals, uh, which is um, uh, in support of a multi-sectoral approach. What, what do we mean by this multi-sectoral approach? Well, we have to work across municipal departments. So you can see here that while health is one of the partners, uh, they have to be talking to agriculture and forestry departments, finance, environment, education, and so on. And they, again, they need to work uh, to engage the private sector, community groups, and NGOs. And to this end, um, as emphasised by Graham and Natalie uh, previously, mayors and city leaders have an absolutely crucial role to play because they're best placed to coordinate this diverse range of, of stakeholders. Well, humans being what we are, uh, we have a nasty tendency to wait till it all gets completely desperate before taking action. Um, sadly, I suppose COVID-19, together with the realisation that, um, that the climate crisis is real and having um, tangible effects right now, has, um, has meant that we are now pushing against an open door and there are many um, initiatives afoot which should help us to achieve um, better control of vector-borne diseases and neglected tropical diseases. So we have the WHO Neglected Tropical Disease Roadmap launched in January 2021. The World Health Assembly adopt, adopted the decision to recognise the 30th of January as World NTD Day. There's a Lancet Commission on eliminating AIDS transmitted disease viruses from cities. Um, and, uh, WHO technical consultations on the response to malaria in urban areas. They are also poised to launch a global arbovirus initiative and um, as touched on earlier, this new Healthy Cities, Healthy People initiative specifically to support urban leaders and mayors um, uh, to, to create Healthy Cities for All with their focus on, on reducing rates of infectious and vector-borne diseases and NTDs. The Kigali Declaration uh, is to, um, to galvanise political support and um, hopefully also a financial commitments to reducing neglected tropical diseases. And the plan is to bring this to, to the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which will hopefully be in Kigali next year. So is it still mission impossible? Is it all hopeless? Um, it isn't, and there are many, many players outside the usual health um, health sector in, um, players who are, um, have, are making great moves in this direction. To, uh, so, for example, this Making Cities Resilient initiative, and uh, you can see some really important partners, uh, the U UN um, Department for Disaster Risk Reduction, UN Habitat, of course, the World Bank, amongst others. Uh, since I made this slide, it's now well over 400 cities have joined the initiative with projects all over the world. They provide cities with resilience plans and access to knowledge, experience, networks, tools, and so on. And I like their slogan, of, uh, which is 
introduces a sort of element of healthy competition of my city's getting ready is yours. So it's not hopeless. We can do something, but we have to act fast. Thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. And I must acknowledge uh, the funders of the Bova Network, the Global Challenges Research Fund, which is a partnership of BBSRC, MRC and NERC. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Fiona, for that wonderful presentation. Um, there's a slide in there which you showed all the different, the, the, uh, the, muni the municipality breakdowns, different departments. I think that's going to be coming up in the Q&A in terms of how do you find, what do we need to do to make these partnerships happen? Frankly, uh, we'll come to that in the Q&A, but thank you very, very much for that. That was wonderful. And I remember when we last did that, when we last met, we had our little session uh, earlier in the year in terms of built environment. Um, I thought that was a really good session at that time. Um, and it's so encouraging to see how many you know, companies have joined, how many countries and how many kind of uh, new members and this kind of new approach to kind of doing things. And I really hope that this memorandum of understanding is going to open up new uh, horizons, new ways of thinking. So I will come to the Q&A in a minute, but I just want to say thank you very, very much. I think that was wonderful. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities there uh, in terms of um, collaborations and all sorts of stuff. So fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think we'd, we'd, we'll move on to the, the next uh, uh, speaker for now. And I'd like to welcome to the floor, uh, Professor Olaf Horstuck, um, in terms of the role of urbanization and the spread of Aedes mosquitoes and the diseases they transmit. Um, Olaf, we, we last met in the city of Lahore in South <laughs> Pakistan <laughs> about a year and a half ago, just before the, the lockdown scenario happened. Everybody's speaking at the government of Punjab's uh, dengue, first ever dengue conference that they put together. And I remember vividly your amazing talk of how dengue had actually been in Germany many, many years ago. And it really stuck with me all, all, all this time. So very, very happy to uh, and delighted to, to, to have you here today to, to speak. Thanks for joining us. And I think I'll just hand over the, the floor to you, Olaf. So over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Cameron Rafik, um, for inviting me and also for letting me speak. And yes, of course, um, I'm going to discuss a little bit dengue. Luckily, there was no dengue in Heidelberg to say that right now, but the mosquitoes are actually there. And I'm going to show that in a second. So thanks to Fiona Graham and Natalie to discuss um, the questions of urbanization and also what we are trying to do um, also in the context of uh, United Nations level f uh, for further planning, etc. But I also like to look into, and this is um, usually my task there, to where is research and where is practice actually to underpin what we want to do. And I have to disclose that I worked for many, many years in WHO TDR. We were working exactly on the questions of what works, what doesn't work in order to control vector bone disease. Let me start with that, but I think we need a bit of a break. Firstly, very best greetings from the city of Heidelberg, where I'm part-time working right now um, uh, at my old university. You're most welcome to come and visit um, and to see this uh, very nice bunch and entertaining um, lot of people that we have here every year um, studying on different levels in uh, um, public and global health here. But I'm showing you that as well because... Um, uh, Cameron Rafik was already alerting to that. As a matter of fact, ECDC produces very nicely for us um, how Aedes is actually spreading, most likely and almost certainly due to climate change. This is Aedes aegypti, and the red here, sometimes a bit confusing, is where Aedes aegypti is established in Europe. But so not so much. By this Egypt, the Albopictus really is all over Southern Europe. And where I'm, what I'm showing you here is where I'm located in Heidelberg, in the Upper Rhine Valley, really. And this is what um, uh, currently we're um, uh, referring to is where we actually have is, um, long established Aedes Albopictus populations already for quite some time. Um, so as a matter of fact, if you care to know, actually, just as an introduction to what we're doing here, in the Upper Rhine Valley, there's already since the early 19th century, uh, 20th century, 
there are efforts to control the mosquitoes, which is, of course, far more for nuisance and not so much for any disease threat. But as a matter of fact, already since the early 80s in the area regularly, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis is being used in order to control the mosquitoes along the River Rhine. Otherwise, you would not be happy to walk around that area. So that's my disclosure of interest here. We are doing a little bit of mosquito control even where I live nowadays, partly in order to have a nicer life. However, where is the evidence to show that what the previous speakers were saying we want to control particularly for dengue, perhaps for arboviral disease, mosquitoes in the context of houses and in the context of urbanization? So I'm going to present a couple of papers, three actually, one is in the process of being published, where we're going to look firstly into dengue and urbanization. And the other one is in the role of housing. On one paper we did, um, including several diseases, and one that we are currently publishing on dengue. And where's the role of housing, housing structures, and vector control in and around the house to control dengue in urban settings, particularly? If you're not interested at all, but I hope you're interested, then the results are the following. First paper clearly shows us there's a clear cor correlation between urbanization and dengue vector density and disease transmission. There's no doubt about that. We have it proven with a very nice paper we just published earlier this year. When we are looking into control measures, I think it's far more difficult. As you know, dengue vector control and showing that it is truly community effective, not efficacious, but working in real life settings, community effective, far more difficult. And it also requires an awful lot of work. So um, that's why we are questioning really, uh, are we going to be able to be successful? But hopefully we will, and I'm going to discuss that with you in a second. So for everyone who is not interested at all, go asleep, but otherwise please follow what we're going to say in a second. Three papers, the last one in the process of being published, the first one, is a protection of the house against Chagas disease, dengue, leishmaniasis, and lymphatic filariasis, and the role of urbanization. Both systematic reviews, all of them, because that's what I do nowadays, systematic reviews only. The reason for that is the following. Some years back, I thought we need to combine also in entomology knowledge on synthesis, evidence synthesis, for for studies that we're having in order to come up with policy recommendations. Now we published over the year for all the key dengue vector control intervention systematic reviews. Oh, oh sorry, this should actually be animated, so I can't show you to that. And um, we published papers on peridomestic space spring, on indoor residual spring, on paraproxifen, temephos, BTI, copepods, larvivorous fish, and all environmental methods. Unfortunately, I can't show you right now how this particular slide opens, but we actually tried to say these are methods where we are fairly confident they have an effect on larvae on, or if targeting as well adults or if they were measuring dengue disease transmission. This particular synthesis of all these papers in prior years actually led us to believe that it is enormously difficult to come up with a package of interventions, how I call it, most likely targeting larvae and adults together, that is clearly going to control dengue, not only um, when you're delivering it, but also that you're being able to deliver in the long run. So knowing that, sorry for that, the slide didn't off, open, we thought we go and move on to another thing. We thought we were going to see what happens if I come up with the um, ideal package of interventions in and around the house. And we're going to look for studies that were covering the methods that were where we can use as a unit of allocation the house. Meaning I'm not just going to look into, uh, am I controlling a breeding place? No, I'm going to control what happens if I control all breeding places in and around the house to larvae in those breeding places, but also to adults and houses? With this sort of principal idea, in order to figure out does protecting the house work, yes or no, 
we went on and looked into several diseases on as one does in systematic review here in this case in Chagas, dengue, leishmaniasis, lymphatic filariasis. And we developed the usual systematic review protocol and came up with a typical quality assessment. Here we use the Cochrane risk of bias um, assessment. And we came up with a clear, also building on the previous sort of um, set of systematic reviews that we did, we clearly feel that we can single out some interventions that are more community effective and also if they are focusing on the house. So not just studies that are measuring under laboratory condition anything, but where the clear focus was, can I protect the house? And they're clearly, and I know that um, Fiona was saying we need to move away from insecticides, but unfortunately the most community effective and efficacious anyway, methods are all related to the use of insecticides, but also treating larval habitats. Waste management plays a role. Modifications of housing structures actually showed in the studies that we looked into, no evidence to control vectors, unfortunately. This may shift with the different studies coming in. And we actually could not for those four diseases in this paper pick up an awful lot of evidence that if we protect the house, human disease parameters are improving. The reason for that is probably human movement, because I can protect the house as much as I want. People go out during the day elsewhere, and that's where you may be exposed to vectors and disease. Right, so that was the key result of this particular paper. But um, we are still hypothesizing that protecting the house may have an effect on transmission. And we need to clearly look into having the most effective and community effective here interventions together in order to have perhaps a favorable outcome. But that is clearly a question of more studies needed, particularly in the context of um, um, uh, randomized controlled and cluster randomized controlled trials. Right. And just to come up with our latest paper around there, we were then thinking where we also need to look into urbanization. And what is the evidence? Because it's always being discussed that we actually clearly have a role of urbanization and the spread of Aedes mosquitoes and the diseases they transmit. And this is more of a question of where people say, oh, it's a no-brainer. But it's no good to have a no-brainer in science. We need to actually document it. So this is the second paper I'm going to quickly describe, and that's equally a systematic review. Here we actually use the mixed methods assessment tool because we had mixed methods studies, as you can pick up in there. But the interesting feature is on this particular paper is we are clearly confident, even with this very mixed bag of studies that we included, 29 altogether, of which you have, of course, the usual correlational ecological studies, entomological surveyor studies, surveillance study, epidemiological surveillance studies, and um, some modeling. But what's the key feature is that in those studies that measured anything in urbanization sort of term and distribution and density of Aedes mosquitoes, there we had a strong relationship between vector abundance and also disease transmission. So a um, typical example is the study that I copied there, but that comes through in all studies that were actually of very high quality altogether over the last years. So with this sort of abundance of evidence coming through, we are actually fairly confident that there's a clear relationship between urbanization and distribution and density on one level. So what was the second key result was that Human population density is one of the measures that the studies used in order to describe urbanization. As you know, there's no definition that is everywhere used by everyone, but it seems to me that human population density is the term that is best describing urbanization for our purposes. And when that was being used and if in studies, then we could clearly show a positive correlation like the study that I copied as an example in where we actually show that um, population density clearly correlates to dengue serum prevalence in this particular study. So with this sort of documented evidence, we really don't have any doubt whatsoever 
nowadays that urbanization and population have clear effect on both dengue vector densities and disease transmission. And that we are looking, as our previous speakers also said, in the sort of very nice um, uh, policy documents we are developing, we really need to look into multiple factors if we want to do something about it. However, this is coming from the previous paper and also the new paper that we're publishing right now. And don't forget, it's not just one studies. These are systematic reviews. They are looking into all studies that are dealing under very strict criteria um, with this particular research question. We are still not quite clear how good it is, particularly for dengue, how, if protecting the house is going to show an awful lot of effect in reduction of disease transmission. And we are still thinking that we need scientifically to work on this case, and we would recommend here RCTs, CRCTs, particularly in different ecological circumstances and particularly in different urban settings stratified by um, um, the human density um, and how many people live um, in the area. So concluding in the support of the question of housing and, and urbanization, you see now how I come up with this particular slide. We are very confident that there's a clear correlation between urbanization and dengue. However, what to do is from a scientific point of view, let's say on very high level evidence, still something that we need to discuss further. Clearly, let's say protecting the house against mosquitoes um, only from the nuisance factor is already something very positive. However, we also want to say the investment need to be done in order to reduce human transmission. And there we cannot at this stage really underline and underpin um, firstly, what would be the best package? And I'm here discussing only dengue because that is perhaps arboviral disease in general. But um, the uh, transmission dynamics are different for different for different diseases and different vectors and different different um, um, uh, health areas. However, I'd like to underline that there we see a potential there from what we've seen, but it is not clear cut that we could simply say, do this, do this, do that, and then you reduce transmission, what ideally we would like to see. Okay, in that sense, I would say it's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully I was not um, um, uh, talking complete nonsense for you. And um, um, please ignore this last slide. I'd like, that's um, just a brand, I use it all the time. Um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much and um, um, over to you, Cameron. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Olaf, for that wonderful presentation. Very robust systemic uh, reviews that, that, that you mentioned there. Clear correlation. Um, and I thought it was very, very interesting, this whole... Um, you're going to now have to uh, uh, kind of speak to these policymakers, and I think that's what our Q&A is going to kind of take shape into. I think there's absolutely no doubt that the entomological argument has been made, right? Not just yourselves, but right across the board from day one. But I think this thing now, where we're trying to fit that argument into the uh, wider setting, uh, is going to be very, very interesting indeed. So, Fiona, thanks a lot for coming back and joining us for that. Um, we are now open for Q&A uh, from the audience. There's no need to be shy. I know we've been joined by uh, Alma Lopez as well, another student from Mexico, actually. We've got uh, quite a few other people in there. Uh, Dr. Sh uh, uh, Ayushi Sharma from the Cyprus Institute. Um, we mentioned Daniel from Mexico, we mentioned um, Dr. Dennis Masui from Equatorial Guinea, um, and, uh, Uganda, et al, et al. So you're all welcome to put questions in. What I wanted to do was ask this one question. I think, as, as we've seen, it is now vital to start talking. I think, Fiona, in your slides at the end, you mentioned that the SDG 17, the Partnerships SDG, is possibly the most... I personally believe that's been the most important SDG from day one. You know, healthcare SDG has its own gravitas because it's healthcare and it can be linked to other SDGs if you're doing a measurement, talking about multi-sectorial approaches to, to NTDs as an example, is do you, if, you have a, if you have a solar cell approaching the solar um, modular energy, uh, solar cell kind of in that SDG for sustainable energy, 
that intervention, has it had any effect? Measure it with the healthcare SDG. Is it lowering the disease burden by helping to power clean water sources, reducing disease burden that way? So the SDG healthcare has its own gravitas. However, I'm completely with you. The partnerships are critical. There's a lot of that's going to answer the funding question. It's going to answer the policy question. So my kind of question to you both is actually this. It's kind of a long-winded question, but there's a, there is a question here. We've heard mayors are critical. Right? We've heard mayors are critical. We've heard that from yourself, Fiona. We've heard that from Graham and Natalie uh, previously. And Olaf, you've clearly made that case that if you are now looking at a thousand people per square kilometer, you're going to have a higher chance of arbovirus infection. Dengue, yes, more than likely other arbovirus um, dynamics are going to follow as well. So it's it's clear. So the question is this, those mayors are representing the communities, right, the people. So do we need, I see a parallel with the UHC movement, the universal healthcare movement, in that they're trying to drive demand from the patient group, from the people themselves. They're saying you have a right to demand healthcare from your state, from your sovereign government, demand that healthcare, and let's see if we can build a UHC um, scenario here for you. There's a parallel with this, the human right to housing. You said 60% of the habitats are not yet built that are to be built to 2050. So it's like a uh, uto almost a utopia that we could build. If you, I don't want to use that word, but you know what I mean? It's, it's empty. We can build that. Do the people need to put forward their right for housing? Is this a human right we're talking about? What are we talking about here? Because you can't just, I'm actually getting to the point, we're talking about lingua franca, speaking in a common language with all of these various departments, mayors, all these municipal departments to get something to happen, something to change. So the point is, the, the, the question is, do we need to re, uh, how to put this, uh, realign and try and see if the, we can, on the demand side, on, on the, from the people themselves, we want housing, we, this Mexico City is being urbanized. These are, is that something we should involve or consider? I'll ask Fiona that first. It's a roundabout way of asking you, but I'm, I think you know what I'm saying. Is that demand for housing something that we need to pull in from the people and, and get them to mobilize their mayors, or is it going to be top down to the mayor in a language that probably won't understand? Um, I think it's, I guess it's both ways, but I think uh, this is essentially about development. And um, and I think that people do do have a right to houses that are, are comfortable um, in the most you know, general, you know, we say healthy houses, but houses that are nice to live in. And that's what people, actually care about they probably don't think too much about dengue or any other disease but they don't want to get bitten by mosquitoes they want a nice cool house um, which is well ventilated they want a house that doesn't leak that that's what they care about and what we all want everybody wants it what and um, so I think maybe that's the focus if you like the whole disease health thing it's, it's almost like a sort of entry point to a, a good way to illustrate why these things are important um uh, okay. but they may not be people's top top you know if you ask people in the street that that wouldn't necessarily be the very first thing that they thought of yeah no, no. so um, olaf what's your what's your view on it i mean you've got some very entomological I mean, it's amazing, your work, frankly, it's there, but you, how, how do you see that translating to mobilize those communities to ask their, the people who are in charge of those communities or the funders, the mayors, the political class, how do you get to that step using what you have, Olaf? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to answer you know, with my general public health hat, I'm afraid. And there, I would actually say that or where is uh, our, where are our wishes and where is reality? So I would actually say as a public health person, of course, we always dis describe health as a human right. 
social determinants of health, including housing, you know, sort of plays into that. So you can easily derive something like a human right to its reasonable living circumstances, including housing. Does this mean immediately that I think we should supporting that your government is responsible in order to provide you pro appropriate housing? I don't think this is the reality of what we have nowadays anywhere on the planet, right? Mm. What we do have, however, is that I expect my mayor and also my governmental structures in order to have a clear recommendation what should be um, an appropriate living circumstances, standards and guidelines in creating the sort of environment for that, that this can be achieved. Part of that is, of course, that if we are looking into reality of yeah. urban living in very poor areas nowadays, that we, of course, allowed um, that that living circumstances are um, far less of that we actually would like to see. And I think there we need standards, guidelines and clear, you know, sort of um, um, uh, actions towards trying to set the framework for appropriate um, housing, if that is an answer. That is not so much my study and entomological public yes. health combined hat, but my general public health hat there. I think that's a great answer. And I, I actually find it very interesting, this uh, human right-ish kind of angle on it because if you're linking it you're showing clearly a thousand people per square meter you are going to you're probably more likely to be infected in this brazil city i mean then whose responsibility is that if if they're allowing more than a thousand people to uh you know so where does this responsibility fall we talk about community engagements and all this kind of stuff fine but there has to be a policy line that we cross over and i think maybe this human right thing can be very interesting it'll be interesting to see how that develops healthy cities healthy this whole thing that you've described i mean surely that it could be part of that so that'll be very interesting to see how that uh, develops or goes forward we have got some questions coming through from the audience so i think catherine simon from the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine um is asking a question i'm just pulling it up um yeah. Dr. Snyman, sorry, from based in LS, LS, LSHTM PhD student based in Uganda. So, um, and working with the Infectious Diseases Research Collaboration uh, there. Um, Dr. Snyman is asking, thank you, very interesting. I work on housing modification and malaria. One of the biggest questions people ask is who will pay for it? I was going to come to the funding of it in a second, but great question. Who's going to pay for it? Do you see housing modification as something to be provided by government, NGOs, or financed by the households themselves? I think we're going to have a socialist revolution on our hands by the time this afternoon is over. Who's going to pay for it? Your personal opinion, your professional opinion. I'm going to ask Fiona first because you've probably been hitting against your head against a brick wall in your BOVA um, work you know, across the world, you're probably seeing solutions daily and who's going to pay for them? Who, who's going to do that? Um, well, th there, there isn't going to be a single answer. Sorry about that. But it depends on, you know, the, the different cities and, and towns. You know, there's huge variability. People, um, you know, are already screening their houses. You know, I think a lot of it will be people doing it for themselves. Um, and so I think providing the guidelines is, is useful, but we're not necessarily going to do it all. Um, it's, it, it's interesting that uh, you, your questioner, um, is she, she's working uh, primarily on malaria because there is um, more evidence, um, some evidence that housing modifications will help reduce yeah. malaria. Because Olaf is completely right that it's not there for, for dengue um, and our our deliver paper was kind of looking at mosquito transmitted diseases, um, you know, more broadly. Um, I guess also in that respect, um, we have to sort of clobber it from clobber these diseases from every angle as, as well. Yeah. Um, but yes, the short answer is that the. There, there isn't only one person who pays for it. I think by one of the things we're trying to do um, with, you know, with the memorandum that um, mm -hmm. Natalie and Graham were talking about with the sort of healthy cities, healthy people initiative, is to sort of bump it up the agenda mm -hmm. um, so that which in an ideal world will 
will give the give mayors and city leaders some sort of ammunition for getting more fiscal financial support. But I realise these are all rather theoretical, yeah, airy fairy concepts. No, no, but, it's a hard uh, question to answer. Yeah, it's a hard question to answer because that is the, the thing in the middle of the room, right? Whatever the elephant thing in the middle of the room. I mean, do we need to use your work, the, the very technical, entomological kind of uh, evidence, we're talking about evidence base here, and transform this into a socioeconomic argument? Do we need to, uh, and that's to Olaf, and what's your, what are your views on that, building the socioeconomic argument? I know so that, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I fully agree with Fiona, by the way. Um, and thanks for the question early on from Catherine. Because as a matter of fact, you're quite right in malaria, the situation is uh, slightly different. We can actually, so this and this can actually reduce transmission even. We're not there in dengue. So, um, and I have a feeling it might be more difficult because of when and where infections happen during the day. Um, since mo um, it is more likely than not that in dengue, a lot of the infections are happening, uh, happening whilst you're doing your daily chores and not in and around your house. So come back to that and let's draw into an example of the Global Fund and what we did in malaria. Can we finance interventions via sort of communal mechanisms? So we did that in malaria anyway, isn't it? Into, uh, distribution of ITN was part mm -hmm. of uh, a lot of programs whenever we realized that we can cut child mortality by about 50% if we do it consistently. So we actually have cases where um, we are moving out of purely medical interventions to um, um, uh, interventions that are um, either controlling vector or if I go into water and sanitation, you know, sort of improving living circumstances. So theoretically, I can't see a reason why we shouldn't include elements like that into some sort of financing mechanisms of sorts. Yeah. What I do want is I want clear studies that show it's worth financing and making a business case out of that. We did that in the case of LLIN, ITN. I can't see that in Dengue at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. I hate to say criticizing myself and the work that we're doing over here. Yeah. I can see that for some elements, but we really need to have better evidence base in order to then drive that particular socioeconomic argument, I think. I think that's a fair point. Yeah, that's an absolutely fair point. There are uh, socioeconomic papers, Professor Don Shepard, people like this in terms of dengue, but that's very much on the vaccine side of, yeah, as you well know yourself. You're absolutely right. So, but this is why I'm actually asking that. In any one of these audience there, perhaps there might be a future collaborator in the audience, you never know. Uh, so that's why, why I was kind of asking that. Uh, Kat, uh, Dr. Steinman has come back with thank you. That, that is a question that I've been asked in almost every meeting where we have presented, especially in the sphere of malaria, where bed nets and IRS are government provided. So <laughs> you've got a sympathizer there, most certainly. Um, there's a specific question, I guess, or, or well, there, there's a yeah, well, there is a specific question from Dr. Leo Brack from the Malaria Consortium who have a very interesting paper out actually at the moment with the pyrofroxifen uh, larvovirus fish and uh, dengue combined with community engagement. So talk about multi-sectorialism, but it's actually happening now. But that paper's out there. But uh, Dr. Brack is asking a question to Olaf. So I'll ask you this, Olaf. Did Olaf find any studies that relate reduction in vector density with reduction in dengue? Yeah, we're always really keen on those papers. There's very few, um, and the effect is never very strong. So this is um, um, equally in the papers, then in the series of systematic reviews spread all over. Um, and unfortunately, this is what we would like to see. But I pointed out one of the key difficulties is always linking dengue transmission anyway. So if you're looking into a single intervention, let's say, for example, you're going to use pyroproxifen, which I really like, in many ways as, a, as, a, as an intervention, um, then of course it becomes really tricky to link that particular single intervention into dengue transmission anyway, because it's only a single intervention. It would have, need a massive effect on reduction of dengue, um, uh, on vector densities uh, overall to then perhaps 
have an effect on, on dengue transmission. That's why technically we find few papers, but yes, of course, we find some. Okay, so hopefully that answers you. Thank you for that, Olaf. Hopefully that answers uh, Dr. Bright's uh, question. He's also asking a wider question. I'll ask this to both Fiona and, and yourselves. Does anyone have any idea why yellow fever has not established in Asia? I, I suppose he's asking. Um, sorry, that was it's it's half term. If that noise, we've got some cats, cats <laughs> and daughters all in the house. It's half term. It's you don't want to know. Sorry, everybody. So, yeah, the the question was, wasn't a drum roll for the question. The question is, um, has anyone uh, any idea why yellow fever is not established in Asia with a kind of lean, I suppose, towards built environment differences as Asia and Africa? Fiona. Uh, I'd, I'd ask you. Um, I think Olaf here is the real expert, but I, I suspect, but I think it's, um, so there, there has been good, it's, it's a combination, I think, of good surveillance and good luck. Uh, I mean, it's been that close. And if it does spill over into those populations who are not vaccinated and not immune, uh, it could be catastrophic. Yeah, but I, yeah. Olaf, I shall defer yeah. to your... Yeah. yeah, thank you for that, Fiona, yeah. N nothing to add. Uh, we really don't have a very good clue, as far as I'm aware. We just published a paper that, um, in TMIH, actually, where we looked into revisiting the case of environmental modifications for control of yellow fever in the view of that we're having more and more difficulties with uh, vaccinations on several levels, operational, but also um, efficacy. However, um, all those actually were not from the Asian background. I can only contribute to that. So it's a big question mark for me as well, but I'm actually not um, so uh, much of an expert for yellow fever um, and um, distribution globally, I'm afraid. Okay. So I would ask you, so thank you for answering that. Hopefully, uh, Dr. Brock, that answers your question as well. And thank you for asking the question. And the audience is being a little shy, but it doesn't matter. It's completely fine. I guess it's lunchtime and the blood plasma uh, glucose levels are flatlining for many people right now, but um, oh, that's completely fine. Um, I was going to actually ask a question uh, in terms of uh, this whole thing, that the role of entomology right now, we asked a question earlier in the day to Raman, Dr. Raman Bella Yudun at the WHO, that I've talked to him several times, we've met him a couple of times in Geneva, and we, and we always say the way entomology is taught, it's kind of at university level, right? Is there any argument that you guys can make in terms of bringing, bringing that entomology kind of educational experience earlier on? And why I'm saying this is you're talking about communities here. One of these mem the memorandum of understanding that's been signed between you and Habitat, and one of the reasons it's been signed is to kind of bring together built environment, public health, bring together concrete participation of the local partners the communities, not just the mayors, but the people themselves. So to do that, they have to understand transmission of these diseases. What's, how do you view moving forward? It's a big question, but how should entomology be taught? Only at university, or do we need to bring this in to national curriculums? What do we need to do to make people far more aware? I mean, look at COVID, what's happened now. Everybody's a public health expert. Everybody's talking about our numbers. Everybody, you know, it's the truth. A year and a half ago, there was that was not in the public domain or the public, the, the Jungian mindset of the public, right? It wasn't there. Now it certainly is. So, what about entomology? What do, what what are your views on that? I, I'll ask. Yeah, whoever wants to go first can can go first. Yeah. I think there would be a lot of benefit in having um, you know taught at the appropriate level from primary schools upwards um, and you could do it in a in a way that you know wasn't sort of pure entomology but bringing in all sorts of other useful um, knowledge and, and skills uh, i know there have been projects uh, small ones sort of um, using school children for example to go and survey uh, for um aedes larvae yeah. uh, and um and uh, so i think it's worthwhile to, to have that base there but also young people have so much energy to bring to this sort of thing i think it's really used to useful to um to harness that if you like so i can only see that being something that would be very worthwhile 
so, so, yeah, the earlier the better, basically. I, yeah, I, yeah, totally with that. Yeah. Olaf, what would be your view as a, you know, somebody's generating such strong evidence, a technical kind of look into entomology, what, what's your view? Yeah, funny enough, actually, if I look retrospectively now, I think I can start doing that nowadays, I hate to say it. Um, you know, uh, the one and only thing that I probably did ever in my life is that I brought these funny public health methods, systematic reviews, meta-analysis into entomology, and in this case, in dengue vector control, right? Luckily, Bova is now picking it up strongly, so I really like it. That is good. Um, and I'm saying, why am I saying that? Because it was retrospectively, I thought, um, you know what? Entomology actually kind of seemed to be have been living on its own, really, without trying to uh, to kind of reach out. Not that yeah. it's their fault in entomology as such, but this is simply university education as it was, and how then the services were then being continued. So I had this traditional way, medical doctor by training, I was interested in public health. Um, however, I did my doctorate in entomology, which was at the time still a possibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think these opportunities is what we need to favor in strengthened universities. Entomology cannot be as a single sort of um, in single splendid isolation in universities, but needs to reach out to public health and vice versa, into biology, into geography, etc. Yeah. So it's more about mainstreaming entomology um, uh, knowledge. And only yeah. if we manage that people start from the beginning to work, I believe, in interdisciplinary teams or learn together, then I think we're going to see an effect later that we don't have these silos. Now, um, in many other health areas, we overcame these silos, but I still yeah. think that in entomology, it's not the case. Um, so that would be my answer. I don't know if you totally disagree, Fiona, because I don't really qualify as an entomologist, do I? I definitely don't either. You know, yeah. I have a, I work, uh, I, I'm the sort of uh, manager, sort of the facilitator for BOVA. I've absorbed lots of entomology since I'm married to an entomologist. <laughs> but, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I completely agree with you on the on the way to break down silos is to have that um, really sort of open-ended approach to education where you're not just minutely focusing down on one one little element. And personally, I just think it makes everything so much more interesting once you widen it out and sort of view it in the context of the real world rather than just a dry academic exercise. I completely agree with you. I think perhaps the time, that's a brilliant set of answers there, so thank you for that. And I think perhaps the policy framework, let's say the NTD roadmap to 2030, that's actually affecting NTDs, everybody's guided, one of the major shifts at the, the paradigm shift that they're going kind to of talking about in there, rightfully so, is this entire movement to actually make multi-sectorial partnerships real, moving away from vertical disease focus and actually making it happen. They really want that to happen. They've enshrined it. That's a consensus document. I'm sure you guys probably had input into that in any case. So it kind of has a resonance in the wider community. So maybe it is time to have these modular units. If you're doing architecture, do something on entomology. Yeah. You know, for disease transmission, there's nothing wrong with that, surely. And you might then get the next generation of, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a fantastic idea. I, I don't, no idea is a bad idea, frankly, because as you said, I found that's a stunning stat, you know, that 60% of the urban planning, set, the, the urban uh, build that has to actually happen has not happened yet. Yeah. Up to 2050, the anticipated urban, so it hasn't actually happened. I find that, um, and what an opportunity. That is a, an amazing opportunity, really, for for everyone to come together. So, long live the entomologists! I think I think it's the rise of the entomologists. Yeah. Perhaps perhaps the time is now. You know, for for this to be considered seriously in terms of educating, not just the community. We talk about community engagement and da da da. That's great, but yeah, I'm I'm talking something slightly outside of that. So that, that's great. Um, I mean, we could go on and on and on. I'm pretty certain of that. There's so much to kind of unpack uh, in all of this. Um, the, I am being, we have to kind of 
draw to some kind of conclusion or, or end on this because we're going to have to have a little bit of a lunch break and then at two o'clock it's 1 30 now in the uk two o'clock there'll be the, the following session for the afternoon um, i'd like to say thank you very very much for for participating i hope i haven't just cut the q a short but i'm being told we have to kind of cut because of just the way the system's configured we have to hop to other rooms the trap door will open i will fall down and <laughs> One of those kind of situations. Otherwise, yep. Yeah. So, don't worry. So, there is all of that to consider. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to both of you. Oh, that was a wonderful thank you, Cameron. 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 We really need to go. I, I, I very much would prefer to stay on because I have to go to this very horrible steering committee meeting now. So I'd rather be here and discuss vector control with you. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.